Hello everyone, welcome back and in today's video we are going to be solving a problem from the chapter oscillations and waves and this is the build your understanding question 20 of the chapter. Uh, this problem would require some knowledge of fluid mechanics and oscillations in order to solve this. So with that let's get into the problem. So we, we've been given a wall of a water tank that is inclined at an angle of theta to the horizontal. So we have a square plate of mass m and side l and it is held with its upper edge coinciding with the water level. So the coefficient of friction between the plate and the wall is given to be mu and it's given that when the plate is released it slides down the wall and the water does not enter between the plate and the wall. So this is a very important uh, line over here that you could simply neglect the force uh, applied by water on the bottom surface of the square plate okay so the question is how long will the plate keep sliding that is the time it takes for the plate to come to rest so we have to neglect the velocity and the turbulence in water okay guys so let's say this is how the situation is looking like so what i've done here is i've drawn the side view of the situation and i've also drawn the two dimensional like top view of the situation so this angle over here is going to be theta we have to first determine the force that uh, the water applies on the top surface of the plate Okay, so the force applied by the water on the top surface of the square plate, we can write it in one step as the pressure at the centroid of the square plate multiplied by the area of the square plate. Now, uh, a lot of people actually wanted the proof for this result. Because of that, I'm going to prove this result in this video. So the proof is very simple. So we know that the pressure in this water column is increasing as we go deeper into the uh, water column, right? So the pressure here is less as compared to the pressure over here. So let's say we consider an element uh, at some distance x from our origin over here. Uh, we take a small element of width dx. In our two-dimensional view, it is going to be something like this. Okay, so so this is the element uh, that I'm talking about and as we can see that uh, each point along this particular element is at a constant height of h from the free surface we can say that each point along the surface is experiencing the same water pressure okay so now let's say the force acting uh, on this small element is df and force due to the liquid is going to be normal to the surface df we can write in one step as the pressure at that particular location times dA where dA is the area of this small element. So now what is the pressure at a depth h? Uh, in this particular problem, I'm going to consider only the gauge pressure. And the reason for that is P0 is actually acting everywhere equally. If we consider net contribution to the force due to P0 or atmospheric pressure, it will just come out to be zero. In this particular case, I'm going to take the pressure as rho g h that is i'm only considering the gauge pressure but if the question was what is the absolute pressure uh, acting at this particular point uh, then you have to consider p naught as well okay so now going further we can write h uh, as x sine theta multiplied by dA. So now if you want the total force uh, acting on the body, uh, we'll simply integrate this expression and we'll get the net force acting on the object as rho g sine theta is constant times integral of x dA. Okay guys, so now the thing is the integral x dA, we can actually simplify it uh, in a very neat manner. So, so let's say if you take any random surface whose area is A and let's say if you want to find the centroid uh, of this particular area. So the way we find it is like we take a small area element dA, position vector of dA is r. So the arc, so the coordinate of the center of mass is going to be the uh, weighted average of the position vector. So this is going to be r times dA divided by integral dA or basically the area of the cross section. So <coughs> uh, this is similar to the idea of the center of mass, right? But in surface areas, we talk about centroids. It's exactly the same idea though. So from here, we can simply write integral r dA or in our case, we just took x, right? So integral x dA we can simply write it as the x coordinate of the center of mass or the centroid times the total area. So finally the force uh, simplifies as rho g sine theta and integral x dA uh, is going to be the x, x coordinate of the centroid times the area of cross section. And the thing is we can further simplify this. So let's get rid of uh, all these. And we know that as is a uniform plate, the centroid is going to be at, uh, somewhere over here. Let's mark it as c. So this distance is going to be xc. Right. So and let's say the height of the centroid from the free surface is hc. From here, xc sine theta is going to be hc, right? So I can further simplify this as rho g hc multiplied by the area of cross section. And rho g hc is basically the gauge pressure at the centroid multiplied by the area. And this is the result uh, that I was talking about. So yeah, that's what we had to prove. Uh, the only result that we'll be needing in this problem. Okay, and one more important thing, guys, the force is not, the magnitude of the force is PC times area, but the point of application of the force is not at the centroid. In fact, it will be somewhere deeper than the centroid. And the, the reason for that is simple. If you observe the forces that are uh, acting at each point, 
we know that the width depth the pressure is increasing right so the pressure is going to vary something like this so clearly it the center of pressure uh, is go is not going to be at the center right it will be somewhere below the center or basically deeper inside right uh, for the purpose of this video i'm not deriving it but it's useful to just keep it in mind that the net force is not acting at the centroid you know of the surface centroid of the surface in fact it is slightly below it uh, for the purpose of this video we don't really need it so i'm not deriving it here so now let's move on with our problem okay so let's begin with the question guys so first we have to find the force acting on the upper surface so let's consider this is the centroid of the square and let's say the coordinate of c you know along this incline is x and the reason i took this is because the plate is going to be moving along x right so it's convenient to, to pick this x coordinate and let's say the height of the centroid from the free surface is h h is simply going to be x sine theta so now from the result that i just discussed in the previous page the force acting on the upper surface let's call it as fw uh, we can write it in one step as the pressure at the centroid times the area of cross section of the square plate. So the pressure at the centroid is going to be rho g x sine theta and the area of the square plate is simply L squared. Okay, so and let's say the force is acting at a point somewhere over here. Let's name it as Fw. So as you can clearly see guys, so Fw increases uh, with increasing x. So as our square plate moves in deeper, the Fw is going to increase and, tech and as a result, the normal reaction, the surface of the wall increases and hence as a result, the limiting friction is going to increase, right? So now let's write the equation of motion uh, in the x direction. Okay, so there will be an mg sine theta acting in this direction. There will be limiting friction uh, acting in this direction whose magnitude is mu times n as the f nature of the friction is kinetic. And then there will be normal reaction then there will be Fw and then there will also be mg cos theta. So now let's write down the um, equation of motion in the x direction. So that will be m x double dot and x double dot is simply the acceleration of the plate by the way. And this would be equal to mg sine theta minus mu n, right? And n I'm going to directly write it as mg cos theta plus Fw and Fw is going to be rho g l square sine theta multiplied by x. Okay guys, so and I'm just gonna, and I divided the entire expression by m and I finally obtained this expression for the relation between the acceleration as a function of x. Everything else is a constant as you can see. In the problem, we had to find the time it takes for the plate to stop. So we have to find the time at which velocity becomes zero. So, so if we talk in terms of mathematics, then we have to find velocity as a function of time and put v equal to zero in it. And that's gonna be very messy right because uh, right now you have the acceleration as a function of x so you have to write the left hand side as v dv by dx uh, and after solving this you will get velocity as a function of x but this is not enough right now you also have to find now you if you write velocity as dx by dt from there you'll get x as a function of time and you again have to differentiate this to find v as a function of time and here you have to put v equal to zero and then you'll get the time it takes for the plate to stop but but you don't have to do any of these if you if you recognize this expression is nothing but the expression we obtained for a simple harmonic motion right so in the oscillations chapter while we are discussing simple harmonic motion we get the differential equation as x double dot equals minus omega squared x and the solution for this was simply x equals uh, a sine omega t plus phi and the time period of oscillations was 2 pi by omega right so this expression over here is pretty similar to this as in like the x double dot is coming out to be proportional to the minus x right which means it's certainly uh, okay this was a minus sign which means it's certainly shm in nature but the issue is like there is a constant term added to this so basically this is of the form x double dot equals a minus omega squared x right uh, a is some particular constant so if i take minus omega squared what i obtain is x minus a by omega squared so even this is shm but the only thing is uh, it's a shifted SHM. That is its mean position is not at X equal to zero anymore. That's the only difference. Still, the time period of oscillations is unchanged. Okay guys, so now with that, we know that the time period of oscillations is unchanged. So let's say it starts from this point and this is gonna be the mean position. Okay, this is where X double dot, or I'm gonna write it as A, is zero which basically means the acceleration is positive. And this is the point where acceleration is maximum, right? And why is that? Because as you can see, the acceleration decreases as uh, the plate moves further down, but it's still positive, right? So plate is gonna accelerate till the mean position. So till here, acceleration and velocity are in the same direction. But after, when it reaches this point, you need to understand that velocity is maximum here. So after crossing this point, the velocity will still be in this direction 
but the acceleration is now in the opposite direction. And hence as a result, it'll start decelerating. And this is the point where the velocity will become zero. So if you consider this as simply the oscillation of a spring block system, uh, we need the time it takes for the block to move from the extreme position to the mean position and from the mean position to the extreme position again. So, so this time period over here is simply the total time of oscillation divided by 4, right? And similarly, even this time period over here is t by 4. So hence our answer for the time it requires to stop is t by 4 plus t by 4, that is t by 2. And t itself is 2 pi by omega, so this is going to be pi by omega. Now omega is simply the square root of this particular term over here. And if you substitute in the values, you'll get the time it required to stop as this particular value. So that was it for this video guys. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe. That's it. Thanks for watching.